part of the problem. And I want to do it. So you guys at home, can you hear me okay? It's telling me my internet connection is unstable. But I'm not doing anything for a different. Second so. or two, but now you're back. I'm back. Good, good. I'd like to be back. So we're going to zoom in on this system and we're going to kind of get real close so that we can kind of kind of focus on the rolling part of this. Now, you might want you might want to take out a straight edge because I can draw straight lines because it's built into my little thingy here. You might want not the meter sticks. Come on. I mean, if that's all you have, I just I just love how all the meter sticks migrated to the same desk. Because uh, like anything else, in the lack of real toys, no, Kyle, you have lost <laughs> your meter stick privileges. Sorry. Oh, you guys at home, I just want you to know I have a plan that if it works out, I'm still waiting on the gear to get here because it's in a snowstorm and then it got canceled, where you'll have a view of the classroom and a view of me so that you'll be able to see what the kids in the class are doing while we're doing stuff in school. So maybe you'll get a chance to kind of understand what's happening from time to time. I think that what I'd like you guys to do on your own, because I think you can, is I would like you to apply um, all the forces to the object, but make sure you apply them where they act on the object. So just take a quick moment and draw on a free body diagram right here. But instead of drawing them at a single dot, draw them where they act on the object. Lauren asks if it's rolling down or not. I don't know. That shouldn't change the fact, that should not change the, 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 oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to expose you. It was a direct message and it was private. So a student um, whose name will be Bill for right now um, asked uh, if it was rolling. I said, I don't think it matters. There's friction. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Did they ever ask us a problem like this with dragon balls? No, not yet. <laughs> so I hope all of you drew a force downwards. And I'm doing my best to try and make these a bit to scale because it's hard to see otherwise. Now, the next force that I would probably have drawn is the normal force. Because these two forces don't require that we know what direction the object is moving in order for us to draw them in. So the normal force must be drawn from the point of contact and would pass through the center of mass. I hate to ask what movie that is, but somebody knows, what movie is it? Don't know? No. Now the next one is um, harder because we don't know whether this object is rolling up the ramp or down the ramp, speeding up or slowing down. But if we're trying to be consistent with yesterday, it would be attempting to roll down the ramp, which would suggest then that friction is acting this way. And of the forces, friction is the one I've probably exaggerated the most, but these would be the forces that act on the object. Now, what is difficult, I think, for students to wrap their head around is that this still must obey Newton's second law, even though it's rolling. 
which means the net force still has to equal MA. And since the only direction it can accelerate is down the ramp, it doesn't surprise me that we would expect mg sine theta minus friction to equal ma. That must still be true, which is sometimes difficult, I think, to, to grasp because it's not sliding. How is this frictional force actually acting to keep it from moving? But it is because Newton's laws aren't about the motion necessarily. They're about the inertia. So this frictional force acts against the motion of the object. It just so happens that in this case, it is perturbed by the rotational inertia of the system. Now, the next part to do is, is, is more challenging because this is a dynamic system. This doesn't tell us enough information to figure out the frictional force. And even though we could extend this to deal with the X direction and the Y direction, which would tell us therefore that that's gotta be zero and normal force therefore must equal mg cosine theta. This still does not give us enough information to figure out what the frictional force is. Because as we've talked about before, the frictional force is on a sliding scale beneath some maximum. And we don't know that we're there yet. That requires that we deal with torque now. Now, this is, this, is, this is hard for me to say because I'm going to use the wrong vocabulary. It's just the vocabulary that I think of when I think of this. To deal with net torque, we need a pivot point, a fulcrum. And I think a lot of people would prefer to place the fulcrum at the center. But that point actually isn't move. I'm sorry, that point isn't the actual fulcrum. It's moving. The actual fulcrum is at the point of contact. It pivots there, even though it doesn't actually pivot, but that point doesn't move. The truth is though, you can use either one of these. The thing does roll about its center of mass. I like to think of this one as like a virtual pivot point where this is the actual pivot point. The word virtual, you won't find in a textbook. No one's gonna call it that, which is kind of the way I like to think of it. You can do the problem with either one of these and it is not easier or harder. It's the same level of difficulty. This is not like the toilet paper one where it was made much easier to do it about the edge. This one is going to be harder. So I'm gonna change the rules just a little bit for us from yesterday and the rules that I'm gonna change is the moment of inertia is I. I want you to leave it in terms of I. And I don't care whether you use the virtual or the actual, I'm gonna do both. So you can see that it's the same regardless. But I'd like you to create a net torque equation and complete it by putting in the torques. If you're gonna use the actual, you will have to use the parallel axis theorem. If you're gonna use the virtual, you will not. So I will wait a short time while you do this. I will pause our recording. Oh, that's really loud. All right, so um, you should be done. I would expect by now you might not be, but I, uh, I don't really want this to take the whole class period. So I did the virtual and the actual. So part of my problem today in my, my e &M class was a lack or willingness of people to stand up and say, I don't get part of what you did. Let's not, let's not stand on that today. Look at yours, look at mine. If there's a difference, point it out. Find out whether I did something wrong or whether you need to understand what I did. Could you explain again why the actual fulcrum is the fulcrum? Yes, I could. Um, I chose that as the fulcrum because it's the point that actually does not move with respect to the object. So technically it stays in place, but it's instantaneously in place because the moment the object does rotate, a new fulcrum comes to bear. 
And so we are constantly creating a new fulcrum as the ground rises up to meet the object. But the fulcrum by definition doesn't move. It's a point in space and the object swivels around it. So the point where it's in contact with the ground is the actual fulcrum. Now, that might not be an expression that you, that might not be a definition that you like, but it does help us explain something that we'll see here in a couple of days. So is that an explanation that you're comfortable with or do you need more? Um, yeah, I think it's good. All right, Karen? The, so for the, the pivot point here, the only force that actually causes a torque is the one that has a torque arm this length, which is a radius and this force, which is MG. So when I look at the three buckets that make up a torque, the R, F, sine, theta, I recognize that this is my force, this is the size of my torque arm, and this angle had to be the same angle as the ramp. So that's why I put in sine theta. Is that good? Yes, sir? Why did you put in MR squared? Like I know you're using parallel axis theorem, but why just MR squared? The parallel axis theorem, hold on, I just wanna get back to where it was. The parallel axis theorem states that my new parallel axis has to be the moment of inertia about the center of mass, which I'm saying is just I, plus the amount that I shift it. So in this case, I am shifting it from here, the center to the point on the edge, that is one radius, which is why my shift amount is MR squared. Yes, sir. So for the parallel axis theorem, the, the M that moves the magnet, the F map with the entire object? Yes. Yes, exactly. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, excellent. When I look at the three forces that act on the object, um, in order for it to be a torque, it has to have a, an applied force. We have three applied forces. Those forces must be applied a distance away from the pivot point and must be applied at an angle that, of effectiveness, 90 better, zero, nothing. So the frictional force is applied at the pivot point. So therefore it's not a torque. Same for the normal force in this circumstance. Now you guys who did the virtual should recognize that the reason why the normal force isn't a torque is because it's applied at an angle that will unsuccessfully turn the object. It's an angle of zero degrees, which is why it doesn't cause a torque about the center of mass. All good so far? All right, neither one of these is better than the other. You'll notice they're pretty, I mean, it looks like the frictional one is easy. Like, oh, wow, I have an expression for friction. Yeah, you have an expression for friction based on acceleration, so it's useless. Don't know what the acceleration of the system is. On the other hand, we do have an expression that would allow us to eliminate friction and get the acceleration or eliminate the acceleration and get the friction. Either one is, is fine. Um, what I would like you guys to do first, because now that we're all together, we should verify this against what we did yesterday. Let's find the acceleration. We have an expression from the, for the acceleration from yesterday, or you should in your work. Let's come together with an, ex, an expression for the acceleration. So um, to me, the easiest place to do that is to recognize that I can get the acceleration right here because everything I need for it is there. And to me, that's the most straightforward place to get the acceleration. So I'm gonna solve that for A And I'm gonna group this specifically how I think it makes sense to me, but it might not make sense to you.
I grouped it in such a way that I put the stuff that had to do with inertia together because this has to be unitless. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, because I'm gonna have, I have mass over mass. I divided by R squared is in terms of kilograms then. That has to be unitless. But also if I do it this way, I can real quick compare this to what we should have had yesterday. I know that I was a disc yesterday. I drop it in there, the R's cancel out and I'm left with just one half M, which on the bottom gives me three halves M, cancel out all the M's and I get for a disc, two thirds G sine theta. Is that what you got yesterday? And I, and I hope that's what you get. I, I left it like this because it also gives us the ability to drop in something else. How would a disc work compared to a, a ring? I drop a ring in there and I get a, a, a two in the denominator and I get one half G sine theta. So I can easily compare the different shapes. And I wanna leave it like this because I have a, a hunch that some objects might slide under some conditions and some might not, even if they have the same coefficient. An object that's harder to turn probably is more likely to slide and not roll than an object that is easier to turn. Something that's easier to turn should take less friction to turn. So I'm expecting that we can get to a point where we should be able to see that. But I'm, I'm gonna stop and I wanna make sure we're all together. What we are doing now is probably a little bit outside the bounds of what you'd actually have to do on the exam. There have been rolling questions of this magnitude that involve this, but they'd give you probably the moment of inertia and won't go where we're about to go. So we're gonna go a little further into some of the weeds here. So I'm hoping you're okay going this distance, but if not, speak now and I'll try and make you understand why I think it's important that we go further. Oh good, I just get to do it then. So the next thing I want to do is I would like to come up with an expression for the, the, uh, the frictional force, which is easy to do because we've got kind of an expression sitting right here, ready for us to drop the acceleration in. And so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to finish that off here and put the frictional force right here so we can kind of see it. It's not a big addition. I get on the numerator, I over R squared times M and then the denominator, it's all the same. I over R squared plus M times G sine theta. You might not remember, but we almost always had something like this in situations where we were trying to find the frictional force. This one though, that this is rough and there's nothing we can do to make it look nicer. I mean, we could multiply top and bottom by R squared. That really doesn't do much. Well, it might do something. If I, if I do multiply top and bottom by R squared, I do get something. You see the parallel axis theorem in the denominator, right? And, and you see just I times M in the numerator. So, so we got something, I'm not sure it's better, but it, at least it has some things that I think are okay. You know, I have the moment of inertia about the center times the mass divided by the shifted moment of inertia. But what we're gonna do next is where we're gonna dive into some new territory, something that's tough. So are you ready to see something tough? Because I think this is what's interesting. If you're trying to design a roadway, if you're trying to make a new kind of tire, if you're trying to test a, a circumstance like a, will these wheels work for this robot to be able to go into this kind of area and check for you know, living people in this building? I mean, there's all sorts of circumstances where you could have a combination of surfaces and angles of surface. How do you know whether the thing you have can do the job you want it to do? And this is where we have to leave that realm of you know, kind of safety and be willing to, to really analyze what we're looking at. We have an expression for the, the, the friction real quick. And I'm gonna grab the one that's easier to work with in one, well, at least the one I can memorize real quick. And that's gonna be the frictional force is I am 
over I plus M R squared G sine theta. But I also know that the frictional force has to be less than or equal to mu times the normal force. And I also know that the normal force has to be equal to mg cosine theta. Seems to me I could pull all of this together and create a single relationship that tells me the condition for rolling. It's not gonna be easy though. I'm gonna drop this in first and get I m over I plus m r squared G sine theta is less than or equal to mu m g cosine theta. All right. Well, you guys do see. So what do you, how do I make sense of this part? You guys do see that I could divide both sides by sine, right? Combine my, my, my trig functions. So I'm gonna do that part next. I'm not gonna rewrite the line though. That'd be cotangent, right? Now this part, I don't know if you know to do this, but I see I divided by I plus MR squared. If I could flip it so that I had I plus MR squared divided by I, then I would get a one on this side. And then a single term that has everything in it, the mass, the radius, and the moment of inertia. But when I flip this side of the equation, I have to flip the other side of the equation, which isn't so bad, that's tangent, but it does put mu in the denominator. This part you might not know though, when you invert both sides of an equation, you do have to flip your inequality. I don't know if you know that or not, but if you wanna prove it to yourself, imagine that to really flip both sides of an equation, you're multiplying both sides by the inverse. So I'm actually multiplying the inverse on both sides. Right? This would essentially put the pieces on either side of the inequality. That's why you flip the inequality. Just showing you math rules. Okay, this is it. This is the big deal right here. This, this is a lot. It might not look like it, but it's a lot. But Devon has a question, so I wanna answer his question. Well, you see what I have now, right? I can separate that. I, can, I can't do it when it's in the denominator, but when it's in the numerator, this, and I'm gonna do it right now, actually, so. I'm gonna write this as I over I plus MR squared over I is greater than or equal to tan over mu. That okay? All right. So this is one. Good. Now, anything that rolls, anything that rolls has MR squared in it. Right? You've seen them all. They have to have MR squared in it. Anything that rolls would have to have MR squared or it can't roll, which means all that's gonna be left there is whatever the fraction is, right? If it's one half MR squared, all that's gonna be left is the one half. If it's two thirds MR squared, the two thirds, two fifths MR squared, the two fifths, right? So anything that rolls is gonna have that there. This tells you that if I want it to roll, this condition has to be met, has to be met. The left side has to be bigger than the right side or it doesn't roll. That's it. Now you know. Do you know what the conditions of the road are? 
you better keep the angle under a certain amount. If you know what the angle is going to be, you better make the conditions right. More importantly, you can decide the shape. It's all of it right there. Sometimes this is out of your control. So you determine what you got to send in. Yeah. Is this for any object building or is it just an object building because of the weight that it's acting on? Well, this is all based on, a, on an incline. So this is all because of an incline. But this is the conditions for it to roll. So if you are outside these conditions, your object doesn't roll, it slides. Has to. So we could say it was a 30 degree ramp with a coefficient of 0.5. Will a disc roll? And find out. Well, we'll you, know, you can you can type it all in. You can get your answer. Now, this has never been on the exam. I just like the idea that we can get away from all of it. The conditions for rolling have nothing to do with how big it is, right? How massive or, or how how big around it is. So it could be a coin, or it could be a, a record. The conditions for rolling don't care. Notice the size doesn't matter. It's going to can the size is going to cancel out. So however big it is in radius, we'll cancel out in the denominator. I find that weird. The mass cancels out. You can write this a couple of different ways. There's not, I don't think a better way than a worse way. I, I don't like leaving it in cotangent because I don't have a good feel for cotangent as a number. I like the fact that all the ones here that are 45 degrees or less have to be less than one. Mu's are almost always less than one. I realize that the smaller this, the, the um, coefficient is probably the less chance I have of rolling. And you can see it in the formula right here. And the greater the angle is, the less chance I have of rolling. It also suggests that for any coefficient, there's an angle to which you won't roll, period. Because tan can go to infinity, there's clearly a condition where you will never roll. Think of it this way. The object that rolls with the largest moment of inertia is a ring. Right, a ring. A ring has a moment of inertia of mr squared, so the left side becomes two. There is a finite angle where nothing will roll, right? A specific angle. I mean, mu can be what? One at its maximum? What's the angle? When do things stop being able to roll, no matter what they are, no matter how sticky the surfaces are? This is a specific angle. I don't know what the inverse tangent of two is. That's it, 63. I find that interesting. All right, so if you wanna know what I think you should be able to do, Everything on this page, I think you should be able to do. Everything here is something that, I would, that could be on the exam. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this. This kind of stuff, this is, where you, this is where that last bullet point, this is question H at the end of the exam, trying to see, can, can this kids put it all together? Do they want every single available point? There's gonna be a kid who's gonna get this. This problem itself has never appeared on the exam, but I don't think that means he couldn't appear on the exam. We've had ones that have had weird things about what is the conditions upon which something could occur. And this kind of stuff can be there. But I think if you follow this part of the conversation, then you should be just fine for anything I can throw at you. And going back to our conversation yesterday, yeah, you could have done a lot of it here. Could you have done all of it? No. You could never have gotten to the conditional part of the problem without having to go through force. But you could have gotten your frictional force and your acceleration here, but you still would have gotten, you know, mu times the normal force, n equals cosine theta, mg cosine theta. All of that still comes from forces. All right, this is a really, really hard one. This has a lot of pieces to it. And I, and I hope that I didn't, I didn't uh, make you guys go too crazy, but I'd ask this question, but there's really not one to ask. I like you seeing some of these challenging things. This problem is made tons easier if you know from the beginning that it's a disc or it's a ring. If you know from the beginning that it's one of those, all of this becomes just a fraction the whole time. 
So they, they just be aware, leaving it in terms of I is creating a more complicated question. That doesn't happen as often, but it does happen from time to time. I want to start another example, but it's one we won't finish. But does anybody have any follow up about this yet? Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is easier. It is easier. So Has anybody ever heard of a governor before? Not like DeSantis is our governor, but something that would govern the operation of a machine, a governor. Um, anybody, if, has your family ever rented a U-Haul? Oh, somebody, Ryan, you asked a question and it was a long time ago. Um, why didn't I substitute I with one half MR squared? Oh, because I was trying to do it for any, any of them. I'm sorry, I didn't see this in the chat. Do you understand now why I did it that way? Yeah, you're good. Thanks. I know it's like 20 minutes ago, so you should expect better of your teachers. Um, if you've ever rented like a U-Haul or a rider truck or something like that, they have governing systems in them. They have a system in place to ensure that you will not go over a certain speed. You know, so most of those are electronic nowadays. They weren't always electronic. Sometimes they're they're manual, like that you would just put. A, a plate underneath the gas pedal so you couldn't push it in too far, which sounds silly until you realize that you could just pull the plate off and go faster, which is why they had to stop doing that because that's exactly what people would do. You're moving cross country, you wanna be, you'd like to go faster than 45 miles an hour. There are mechanical governors, things that are more than just a plate behind the, the gas pedal. And what we're about to see is one that used to be employed for steam engines for the steam outlet. And the idea was to get this to turn would take more and more energy and therefore would take higher pressure steam, which would restrict the steam if you tried to push it too fast. That's what this is, it's a governor. So generally you have two weights and they were almost always round and you've seen these in pictures of old locomotives because they always show this thing spinning or they'll show in a laboratory, these two little things that spin. They are held to a, the top of a spindle, like so. And the system is designed to spin around, all right? Let's say that they're both the same. They both have mass M and they're on a rod of length L. And furthermore, Let's treat the system as if these are point masses, okay? Point masses. Let's say currently at their current angle, they make an angle theta with the vertical. What's the moment of inertia of this system? Again, you can treat these as point masses. Take a minute and see if you can come up with the moment of inertia of this system. We are saying the rod has very little mass compared to the balls. So the most of the mass is at the weights at the bottom of the rods. You can ignore the rods. Don't be too long about it because this one's not too tough. Now this, this situation we're setting up has been on the AP exam about six times that I'm aware of. So this is worth us taking a few moments. This is the beginning of it. It gets a little bit more complicated as we go on. We're, we're, we should be about done now. So does everybody understand it's a certain amount of symmetry? So you only have to figure it out for one of the objects. And did everybody recognize that you're looking for this perpendicular distance here? Sine or cosine? That's right. So this is going to be 2 m l sine theta. Now, what do you think would happen 
to the angle if I spun it faster? Kyle has his hand up, so I'll, I'll let him talk. Go ahead, Kyle. So right now, you guys should be able to, with the information you know, be able to tell me a relationship between the angle and the speed, omega. Because net force equals MAC, you should be able to do that. So come tomorrow with that information in front of this. Because you also need to think about that as you spin it, you lift the weights so they gain potential energy, right? This is an energy problem and a force problem combined. And it's a tough one, but it's interesting. All right. I want you to find a relationship between the rotational speed and the angle. All right, folks, have a good day. I will see you all perhaps tomorrow. Who knows? Today could be the day that one of you runs me over with your cars. I almost got hit on the way to school this morning. So, you know, I don't assume it's you guys. It could be a parent too. Black SUV, Cadillac. Anybody know anybody? All right, bye guys. I'm gonna shut down this. Wait, you said find a relationship between what? The angular velocity and theta. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.